Where do we go from there? We have had a great series of discussions with Pastor Chris Berg and myself, Hollis McGeehee. We've talked about who God is, that God has always been, how God created everything, and then we messed it up by turning away from God and how we are reconciled to God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And we've discussed the Word of God, the importance of knowing that it is the Word of God, not the Word of man. Pastor Chris is back with us today, and we're going to look at what it means to be saved and how to be saved. And now we need to answer the question, where do we go from there? Early in my full-time pastoral ministry, I was in a small rural church up in Iowa, and we had a, a lady who was probably at 40s or 50s, and she had just gotten saved. She had just trusted Christ, and she was looking for a church that, that she could plug into. So she was saved when she came, very young in her faith. And the reason she started coming to our church is that she worked quite often in the evenings, and we had a Bible study on the night she didn't work. And we were the only one that had the Bible study on the night that, that she was available for. And so she started studying with us, and during in that midweek Bible study, and she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I would, I'm saved and I'd like to get baptized. Uh, and I went over, asked her testimony and asked her the questions about making sure that she in fact had trusted in Christ alone for her salvation, not, not a work salvation. And, and then we went over baptism and I, with the idea of you, you recognize that if you're not going to heaven, now getting wet isn't going to help you, right? Went over that. She had a good understanding of that and just wanted to be obedient for all the right reasons. She wanted to get baptized. A few weeks later, I baptized her. About a week later, she comes up to me with a very frustrated look. Maybe not frustrated isn't the right word, but concerned. Just had a question. You could just say, you could just see the question on her face. Perplexed, maybe. Yeah, perplexed. And, and I saw it and I said, what's going on? And she said, I've gotten saved, trusted Christ. And I said, yeah. And she said, and, and I've gotten baptized. And I said, yeah. And she looked at me and she had two words. She said, now what? And, and I said, what do you mean now what? And in, in talking with her, it was like, I have a check mark <laughs> at salvation. I have a check mark at baptism. Where do I put my next check mark? And, and it was just a frustrating thing for her to not know on my to-do list, what's next on the to-do list? And, and so that started me thinking about how do I answer this going forward? Because at the time, as a young pastor, I had never given that any thought that somebody would come up and ask that question, now what? You were really encouraged, I would imagine, to hear the question after you thought about it. You wish everybody sitting in the pews would say, now what? They yeah. would be seeking a higher level of a closer relationship, more Christ-likeness. So what was your answer? I gave <laughs> some horrible answer, I'm sure. I can't even remember what it was, uh, but it was probably something along the lines, and I, I wasn't necessarily wrong, that it's not a checklist approach. I, I think that's all I could really coherently explain is that the Christian life is not a checklist. Because it says we're to walk with Christ, which is a step-by-step, moment-by-moment endeavor. And it's not, oh, good, I got this taken care of, and now I don't have to think about it anymore. Wouldn't that be nice if in our spiritual walk, we only made accomplishments and never backtracked? That would be wonderful. I don't know anything about that because I'm the best backtracker there is, or the worst maybe, because I'm constantly moving backwards. I had a football coach, and he was not a believer. He was not a Christian. But he would tell us in football, he said, you, you either get better or you get worse. You never stay the same. And, and he, of course, was talking strictly about football. But I've taken that wisdom and applied that to my Christian life as well. I'm either growing or I'm shrinking. I'm never staying the same. And that was the concern I had with the checklist approach is that once I cross something off, I'm good. And I don't ever have to concern myself with growth anymore. Through with that. Yeah. Through, cause I checked it off. And so this is a great question of answering now what, 
where do we go from where do we go from here? I think Francis Schaeffer wrote a book and it was called something like How Then Shall We Live? Yeah. In light of what God's done. <laughs> Almost, yeah. How then shall we live? So what would today's answer be for you in a general sense? And then maybe we can move into breaking it down. There's a few different areas I, I could go to, but the first thing I want to mention is even though I'm a guy, feelings are okay to have. I, a lot of guys talk about, I'd prefer not to have them. But the feelings I have are hungry and sleepy and those two usually 90%. But so feelings are good, but we don't live according to how we feel. The feelings can't be the, the engine of the train. And sometimes I don't feel like I could see people saying this for people say this. I don't feel like a Christian. Am I a Christian? Cause right now I don't feel like a Christian. And I think part of it is our society has elevated feeling so much that, that Feeling has become the most important thing. It supersedes fact. I've heard people say on the news when something bad happens, uh, nothing's more important than the American people feel like they're safe. And I always say, no, th that's not it. There's nothing more important than actually being safe. I, I don't want to feel safe if I'm not that. And I, and I don't want to feel vulnerable if I'm not, I, I want my feelings to to exactly correlate to the facts in front of me and any feeling that deviates from the truth is an inappropriate feeling is a, it's a lie. And so I don't want to feel safe. If I'm not, there are so many more important things than feeling safe, actually being safe. So for a lot of people, we, we really want to make them feel saved. I don't want them to feel saved if they're not, uh, that would be a huge mistake to assure them of a salvation they do not have. Conversely, if I don't feel saved, but I am, that that's unhelpful as well. So I think understanding salvation is a fact and not a feeling and getting that taken care of is probably a, a good first step. Yeah. We want them to know that they're saved. I had an experience in the Ukraine many years ago. I think it was in 1996. And I was there and I was visiting with people in a medical clinic situation. And I used that opportunity while they were waiting to see the medical personnel to, to seek to evangelize and hear their hearts and pray with them. And what I came to find out is that a high percentage of the people that I saw were Christians, but they had no assurance of their salvation. They were like, I hope so, I might can. And usually that indicates there's not a salvation, but when I asked follow-up questions, they it was clear to me in my heart that based on Scripture that they were saved people. They just didn't have an assurance of it. So there's two sides of that. Yeah. There's We don't want them going into battle of life thinking they've got on their bulletproof vest and they don't. And we want them that have it to remember that it's not going to come off. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's based on the fact of, have I trusted Christ as my savior, faith alone by in Christ. Alone. Yeah. And then to understand that, that feelings can be manipulated in so many ways. I, my feelings change based on what I eat when I eat it. If I have pizza after six o'clock in the evening. That affects my feelings. And so we don't want it to be beyond that. We don't want it to be based on, on having excellent meditative music in a worship service. Not that professionally done or to doing something well to the glory of God is wrong, but sometimes I think we rely on trying to manipulate feelings rather than explaining the facts and having our faith in the facts, not our faith in our feelings. Yeah, I think the greatest, one of the greatest joys to me personally, is to reach that place where I know sometimes I forget and I revert back, but for the most part, to know that God is God and what's going on around me or what's going on within me, don't change that. And that my 
place with God in Christ Jesus is completely secure, completely a place for peace and rest and protection, no matter what the weather is, like the old wonderful hymn that was born out of great tragedy. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, God has taught me to say, except when I forget it, that it is well with my soul. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's the solid foundation of, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong with that. The backstory of that is the gentleman lost his family crossing, crossing an ocean and that, and that that when he was near that spot where that occurred, he could express and thinking about the loss he had, it is well with my soul. Quite a, quite a testimony. That was Horatio Spafford in the, maybe around 1860 or so following the great Chicago fire. And he lost his two daughters in the shipwreck and his wife was saved. And he was going over to England to meet and visit with her and to to commiserate over the terrible loss they had sustained. And when the ship that he was on came into the area where the other ship had gone down, he, they had some sort of memorial on the ship's deck. Of course, we're talking about old sailing ships. And he either had the idea or maybe actually wrote it during that time. So we have this, what we've been saying is, what we've been saying is that, that feelings aren't the basis of our salvation. And, and we've been talking about certainty. And I know that there are a lot of people, even within the umbrella of Christianity, who would say, you can't know. And to even suggest that you can know for certain that you're saved is a sinful thought. Do we have a biblical basis for saying that we can know? We do. And I think you're going to be able to share that with us in a moment, but I know that there are several places that say that to me unequivocally and something along the lines of these things are written so that you may know that you have eternal life. That the gospel of John, he was very selective in what he wrote, the miracles he recorded, the sayings of Christ, the I am sayings in Christ. And, and he writes many other things, many other miracles, many other stuff happened. He said, but I selected these miracles. I selected what I selected so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ and that you may know that you have life in him. That's a summary of what John wrote, that you have life in his name, that you can know it. And if you're an individual who has trusted Christ as your savior, you recognize that your goodness, your good works, the things you do could never appease a holy, righteous God because, because you haven't met that standard of perfection, which none of us have. And so you've come to Christ in trust, faith, that, that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose again, proving that death and sin had been conquered and your faith is in Christ alone. But you're not sure. You, you have those doubts. You have that uncertainty. I'm reminded in the Gospels where there was a guy with doubt and he said, I believe talking to Jesus, but help my, uh, help me with my doubts. Uh, the way which I think you need to do is, is you need to go through what is the gospel again and begin uh, to read the gospel of John would be a great place to start. And, uh, and don't try to, how can I manipulate my feelings? But instead did Jesus, is sin an issue? Did Jesus in fact live a perfect life? Was Jesus the perfect sacrifice? And have I trusted in him alone? And if you can answer those questions, yes, then you are saved regardless of, of how much pizza you ate after seven o'clock at night. That, <laughs> it doesn't change anything of, of the truth of what Christ has done. Yeah. And part of that, that knowing is not just to know that there's salvation in Christ, but to know that in the present tense, uh, because he doesn't say, I've written these things so that you know that you will have, but mm -hmm. that you presently have. I yes. think that so often, so many people who have been born again live, uh, and I'm one of them for quite a long time, 
who live like we've never, if you could use the entry into a temple or a church as an analogy, we live like we're on the front steps waiting for the door to open. Or if we're really, really deep Christian, we've made it into the foyer. Yeah. But the good stuff is all inside. And like we read in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I believe it's in chapter one, where he says all the spiritual blessings, blessings of the heavenly places are ours now in Christ Jesus. It's such an amazing change from being saved to being uh, not feeling, but knowing that you are saved, that God doesn't change. He doesn't love you more on the days when you get a little more right than wrong. He doesn't love you less on the days when you don't get that, but that he's looking at us as if we're clothed and not as if we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And so it's never about our performance. It's about what Jesus has accomplished. And so we can go forward with great confidence, not because we're so great, but because our Savior is perfect in every way. No better way to say it than that. So that might be a good place to, to pause for where do we go from here? And I think next time it might be good for us to start looking at some not to go back to a checklist, because that's certainly not a way to live, but to recognize the tools that God has given us for a daily life of growing. And we want to grow because I've found out at my old age that how much I missed of joy and peace and just wonderful life that I tried to, as the old country song said, I was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> and today I know that peace and joy and it, it, the things, the ups and downs of life that are inevitable. And especially as you age, don't change that. In fact, they, my experience is they enhance it. So we'll look forward to that next time. God willing. So thank you all for being with pastor Chris Berg and myself, and we pray God would bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you now and forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.